Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with your charismatic host and prominent safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Be entertained and informed as the Safety Doc discusses both best and bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. The truth will keep you safe. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Hi, everyone. This is David, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. I do have the camera set back a little further today so you get to see more of the environment here where the Safety Doc Podcast is filmed live before a studio audience of this person right here, which is a small man carrying a very large rock. So um, anyway, our episode today is Inside the Meticulous Mind of an Expert Witness, Myself, um, How to Identify and Remedy Your Fatal Vulnerability. So one of the things that I do is I serve as an expert witness in litigation across the country, uh, more or less with school litigation, uh, following policy and procedure having to do with uh, non-discrimination, people non-discrimination, harassment, bullying, and things in that area. So I'm going to talk about that today because there are definitely points that you'll be able to take out of this to help prepare yourself in the event that you are ever um, litigated against. I, I guess some very common sense things and and some processes that you can take individually or that your organization can take to lessen the risk of uh, being vulnerable uh, during a lawsuit. So that's my that's my hope for today. And I'm going to share some of my own experiences um, during today's episode. So a few anecdotes to start. I was in Omaha over the weekend. First time I've been to Nebraska. So here the safety doc is first time down in what uh, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, Florida, and now first time in Nebraska. So I was there for a wedding. Uh, my Garmin, which you might recall, went a little rogue on me on my trip to Disney. Um, also decided to uh, start freelancing as we were approaching the vineyard where this wedding was held. And it took me in back of Offutt Air Force Base in um, Omaha, um, actually to an area which said, Stop! Barricades were up! guard posts they were abandoned but um basically obviously not the area where the wedding was held um i did get back on track and was able to get to the location um but yeah garmin come on and i've updated the maps quite a bit my brother-in-law um who works for google and used google maps on his phone um, had a much smoother route uh, out to this location so, yeah, I don't know what it is. I love my Garmin, but every once in a while, um, it seems to go to the dark side. So, um, stay on the light side. Don't join the dark side. Garmin, Darth Vader is not your father. Um, a loss, though, of uh, a white dress shirt in Omaha. It didn't get packed and didn't return home with me. So, my only white dress shirt. I think it probably got caught up in the sheets. Um, my my younger daughters, when they might have made the bed at the hotel or whatever. I usually, I'm the person that will check the hotel several times over uh, just to make sure we haven't forgotten anything. And somehow I left this, this white dress shirt in Omaha. So I have already gone about the process of replacing it. But somebody in Omaha is sporting a very nice white dress shirt as we speak. So um, next week I will be interviewing Bree Hansen, a very experienced international traveler, talk about some of her adventures specific to safety. Uh, I talked to Bree today and she said, boy, there are so many stories, it's just kind of hard to narrow down um, what we're going to talk about. But I think we'll focus on the awareness aspect. And then she also um, has a story to tell about once something has happened, kind of what your response could be, um, you know, when you feel your safety might be compromised. But um, Bree recently returned from uh, several days doing a documentary with the crew down in Haiti. 
and we'll we'll incorporate that as part of her discussion. So that's going to be very exciting. We are filming that on May 23rd, um, and then we'll be getting that edited and out shortly afterwards. And then also Preston Rice. Preston Rice, um, owner of Madison Area Drone Service. When I talk about Madison, I talk about Madison, Wisconsin. Um, Preston is an extremely dynamic individual. He has a professional license as a drone operator, um, works with uh, everything from, you know, agriculture to actually have one of his business cards here, which are which are pretty awesome. Commercial, uh, special operations. I, I, I know that they had a skate park event and he donated his time to do an aerial um aerial shot of that so he is extremely knowledgeable and actually the level of certification that he has brings him up to a lot of the knowledge that a pilot would have and we're going to talk about that and actually probably split it into a two-part show and the second part is going to be actually taking the drone out uh okay disclaimer so again i serve as an expert witness in different legal cases mostly to do with some aspect of school safety okay so a disclaimer right away, I'm not an attorney. I've never played an attorney on TV or during a podcast. Uh, this is not legal advice. It's rather an aggregate of personal experiences or cases that I've reviewed to help inform my own professional opinions. I will not mention any specific cases. Um, nonetheless, I will share some common commonalities uh, in being an expert witness, as well as some advice on ways that I've, uh, I've felt that people could have decreased their personal liability or the liability of the organizations that they work for. So I'm going to share that out today. Um, so I'm kind of cross this. I have eight pages of notes here, folks, for this. So the blog will probably be um, be longer for for this entry. But um, so what is, what is an expert witness? And, and this is new for me. This is something I didn't do until a few years ago. I was and, and I was approached to do this by uh, by an attorney, um, and, and then I was able to get in with a larger network um, than which um, kind of highlights my areas of expertise for attorneys seeking um, an expert an expert witness or uh, a consulting expert. And I'll talk about what those two terms mean. So it, it's something I enjoy doing. Yeah, it, it's it's work that's kind of feast or famine. It's not my primary work, uh, but I can have a, a week which can be spent on an evening going through depositions and putting together uh, questions, uh, suggestions for discovery, um, being on the phone, being on Skype with legal teams. And in other weeks, there might not be anything happening. But... Um, but uh, yeah, what is an expert witness? So I, how uh, expert witness uh, investigates, verifies, and organize, organizes facts to testify at trial on the behalf of the, in this case, the plaintiff. I, I only work with the plaintiff. I don't work with defendants. So primarily, again, I work with districts. So it would be people who would be bringing litigation against um, districts. And it's typically uh, parents who bring litigation against districts. I don't do this in my home state of Wisconsin, uh, but I but I do work with um, legal counsel in other states. So, um, what is a consulting expert? So, there's there's a difference between a consulting expert and an expert witness. So let's talk about what those terms mean. A consulting expert is someone that an attorney might contact right off the bat. So um, it's very early in the process. And basically the attorney, let's say the attorney was approached by the parent and the parent says, you know, my, my child um, experienced this, this um, discrimination, for example, um, and the attorney will gather information. The attorney will then reach out to somebody that has, has content expertise in that area and um, in these cases, I'm con you know I'm contacted. Um, they will give me you know largely you know maybe seven to ten pages of, of kind of what they've gathered from from the the plaintiff, the potential plaintiff. Um, and at that time, a, a litigate you know a lawsuit litigation typically hasn't been filed. This is someone who's approached an attorney, basically saying, "Do I have a case here? Do I have a case?" And then the attorney, you know, the attorney is, is an expert in law, but they're not an expert in 
the areas that I have my expertise, school safety, understanding uh, school operations, being in schools for 20 years, high stakes decision making, um, school systems, things like that. So um, so what, I, what happens is I become a consulting expert and I get paid a certain amount to do um, to perform in that role and basically a consulting expert can be used to help a client and his or her attorney gain a better understanding of how best to represent a successful case. So again, they'll present this and say, what do you think about it? it do we have a case here? Um, and, and if so, how would we proceed with it? So I investigate the facts of the case as presented by the, the parents and then any information that the, the district might have uh, or, or, or that the attorney might have, such as a police report or something like that, emails, whatever. Um, I might do some additional research into the, into the field, into some legislation, into laws regarding bullying and non-discrimination, into some of the school policies that are publicly available. Um, I'm not spending a lot of time on this. I'm, I'm getting a feel pretty fast for, is this something that is going to make a viable legal case? And uh, if so, do I want to be involved in it or not? That's my choice. I turned down a number of cases. And um, just because I don't think it is, one, a good fit for my knowledge base, someone else has a different knowledge base with it, um, or, you know, the, the sec, you know, you can have a bias, you could just have a, a conflict of interest with it. And, and sometimes it just is, is something that, um, you know, someone asked me to go up against a large school district like Chicago or something like that. I'm probably not going to do it because, um, you know, their, their lawyer team that's going to come up against whatever lawyer team I'm working for. Um, it's just going to be a long process, and I'm not sure. I typically like to do, um, get involved in processes that tend to wrap up within about six months. So, but you know, it's a strange thing though. I have, I have like full confidence in my abilities, <laughs> and and you really have to have that to be in this role. You can't be thin-skinned and to and to be an expert witness at all because um, there are definitely um, you know efforts to discredit you as as an expert witness. Um, uh, being someone who attended several board meetings, had attend, presented board meetings, be grilled by, um, you know, an unhappy audience about a, a budget and so forth. I mean, you, you do have some definite conditioning which prepares you for this type of, of role. And just my knowledge base. I mean, I feel I know this content, especially having a PhD and working in this, having the safety doc shown in other areas that, that I know this content very well. I remember going into one um, testimony and, and the lawyer said to me, this was years ago actually, said to me, you know this stuff better than anyone around the table and don't forget that. So um, anyway, uh, for example, let's say um, uh, a special education, um, individualized education plan. So a student with a disability has an IEP, an individualized education plan. Um, I'm going to help that legal team with understanding that referral process, with, with how the testing went, uh, qualification meetings, you know, the parents probably provided the IP documents, um, understanding of least restrictive environment, interpreting those documents, and looking for any procedural inconsistencies within those documents. I might go on the district website to see what their process is for if you're suspecting a student with a disability, how you, re you refer that student, you know, and things to that effect. So, so that, that's ways that I'm helpful. Um, and, and for example, sometimes with districts, they, they don't understand the fact that um, if you're challenging placement in an IEP, individualized education plan for a student with a disability, that really goes through a due process hearing, uh, which is really very procedural. Um, and that's outside of something that might be civil, which is, for example, that you're, you're seeing somebody act it. Um, in a negligent manner and not carrying out something that it wasn't an IEP or something that should have been brought to the attention of an IEP meeting. So, um, you know, due process is really out of my hands. You know, you're not bringing expert witnesses for due process um, hearing. So, but it's things like that that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk with the legal and, and say, you know, the way you're going with this, this is probably going to go down a due process. So if you want to get involved, you know, you get involved. But as far as like my role in this, probably pretty minimal. Um, so again, what is a consulting expert? A consulting expert is retained to educate the attorney and the client on issues relating to the expert's areas of expertise as those issues relate to the case at hand. Um, 
tend to assume that the attorneys have deep knowledge base in many fields. And the reality is that attorneys, um, as, as helpful and as, as trained as they are, they're experts in law. But for example, they probably know little about how a public school operates day to day. That's where I come in. Um, this was similar to my expert role with uh, David Ops back in the summer of 2016. And I did this show not too long ago when I talked about making the intruder film with David. Um, you know, I was brought in as the content expert because I knew the content of what might happen if an intruder, you know, entered a playground or entered a school. Um, I, I knew that very well. So I was able to help the development of the script and then also the directing of the script in that. And it's, that's, that's very similar to the role of a consulting expert. So the consulting expert is really kind of the surface, um, the, the, the first surface level of saying, do we really have something here that could be a case? And I'll be very honest with people of saying, I think so, or, you know, I don't think so. Um, and another part that comes into the question is, how do you get paid as an expert witness? Um, one, you can, being an expert witness can be very lucrative. I, I do it for the justice aspect and I do it for the challenge part of it. And I really do it to change systems. I mean, if it is, um, the cases that I take typically involve something very egregious that's happened in a school. And my hope is that through my involvement in the case, that the procedures in the school, the policies, um, how that school, um, acts with uh, similar cases in the future uh, is different and have a produces a different outcome that's really my intent i really i, I really have that intent um, but let's talk about so there's a misperception that an expert witness receives a percentage of a settlement okay i've had people come up to me and say oh if it settles for whatever then you're going to get a cut of that no that's not how that works i have a set fee schedule um, and and that fee schedule then is is followed by the by the plaintiff. Uh, there's something called a retainer. So a retainer is not refundable, and a retainer basically secures my services as an expert witness. So um, the fact that I'm brought into the case and that might then be be known by the defendant um, that might spark a settlement um, based upon if they're researching you know my expertise and, and understanding um, what I bring to the case, there might be um, an impetus to seek a settlement. Might be, maybe not, but um, let's say for example, a retainer was $5,000 um, and the case settles a day later, I still keep the retainer. So that's how that works. So retainer is not refundable. Um, I work until the retainer is, is um, expend it and then I ask the legal counsel to replenish the retainer and the legal counsel has the choice then to say okay we'll give you this much more money and you can work up to that and spend that out and then I stop so really I never have anything like that's past due that I'm seeking from a law firm everything is, is pretty much paid up in advance if something were to after that initial retainer if something were to settle um, then I do refund whatever I did not um, um, a, a crew in in cost you know for going through depositions or so forth like I would refund that that back if it wasn't encumbered it goes back to the to the legal counsel so um, but you know I have fees for and this is very common phone calls uh, video conferencing reviewing documents generating interrogation questions researching topics uh, most communication I do is remote. I have a distance learning lab. I can Skype in with legal firms from account around the country, saves them money. Um, you can also do that in the courtroom. You can, you can videotape uh, depositions. Uh, if I do need to appear in person, of course, that is a much higher fee, but you can do much by, by video these days. Um, so I have depositions or other materials securely sent to me in paper form. <laughs> I learned that early on. It's like I do not need to to kill my printer by having it print off 800 pages of deposition or something like that. I do have a fee for what I what I print off for a page, but basically, if you're sending me anything, you're sending it you know securely by FedEx or or whatever. And it's signed for, and and that I'm getting that. Um, if it's depositions that I am receiving that. So um, that, you know, that's that's how that works. So I do have then large boxes I keep in a secure area and then I kind of divide those out and I go through those. But it's much easier for me to work in paper format, make notes, make references. And everything too has, um, 
a a page number on it because it can all be entered in as an exhibit. So it might be, you know, page A, you know, 00001 or, you know, A0002 or whatever it is because those pages can all be entered in as exhibits. Also, it's much easier for me to go back and to reference certain pages and paragraphs and things like that and say it's this page and whatever, like we need to look at this. Um, so I have those fees. And also, you know, fees are, are negotiable. There can be some obscure things that come up. Um, and actually, I've raised kind of my fees across the board lately. There's, there, there's a lot of demand to do um, what I'm doing right now. So um, I have, um, I, I reserve the right to exit a case at any time. So I have that built into my contract. And basically, it is, it is a, um, you know, there could be, a conflict of interest that develops. I could simply find that the arrangement's no longer productive for myself or the plaintiff. Um, and in this case, you know, I, re I return any of the unencumbered, you know, dollars. So it's kind of that force majeure type of, of thing, you know, something happens. But um, I can, you know, leave a case at any time. I'm not bound to that to that case or to that law firm. That's a reciprocal relationship with the law firm also. Um, so far, never had to, to do that, um, but it is one of those things um, that I do have available to me. So I also have a self-invoked suppression order. Basically, like if I'm working on a case, and I'll never mention any case that I'm working on, but if I'm working on a case, um, I'm always working for the plaintiff, for example. I mean, you don't work independently. I'm working for the plaintiff. Um, who's representing the often parents, but, you know. And um, in, in those cases, if I were, well, first of all, I have a self-invoked, um, what's called a suppression order. So I'm not talking about the case. But if I were to exit the case, I do not make any reference to the case at all, ever. Kind of like a gag order, but it's like forever. Like there's no mention of it. And, you know, life, life goes on. Um, so the the defendant will aim to discredit you when you're an expert witness. So they'll bring in their own expert witness. Um, they will will you know they'll largely. Um, so the, first of all, the bottom line here in my role is to be concise, stay focused, be a second order thinker. I've already talked about that. A second order responder. Think about what you say. There's techniques that other attorneys will use. You get to learn those techniques after a while of monitoring the pace of their speech. They'll try to speed up, you know, your response or they'll try to slow down your response um, and try to use open-ended questions instead of yes-no questions. Um, virtually everything in a, in a courtroom is, is divergent, meaning like there's many, many ways um, things could go like they'll say well couldn't have this been an option or couldn't have this been an option or couldn't have this well yeah i mean everything has an option it's the my responsibility to say well in my professional judgment the probability or the prioritization of this in my experiences would be these would be more likely to happen than these not saying these couldn't happen i'm just saying my professional opinion is these are more likely to happen than these um so that's what a jury would hear um so uh, your expert position will be questioned or your methods will be questioned. Probably your methods. Your methods are going to be questioned. Once you're there as an expert witness, if the defense tries to discredit you as an expert witness, um, that's often seen as kind of bullying and just is and just kind of a, um, uh, I, I don't know. It's not a very impressive tactic. And I, and I think that, um, especially uh, juries, you know, see see through that, you know, if they're just blatantly trying to, to rip away any credibility. It's like, well, okay, I was on PBS. I presented after Sandy Hook, you know, the entire nation watched me on school safety. I have this show and PhD from uh, UW-Madison, you know, ranked uh, within the top five in the country and the studies that I've done. But, you know, wh wherever you want to go with this, you can you can work the angle with the attorney, but what they'll do is they'll, they'll try to angle uh, onto your 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 strategy of what you analyze and say, you know your your analysis was was incomplete, um, and and here's a different way you could analyze it. And had you done that, you probably would have come at different results. So, um, you know, and and again, the reality is 
um, you know, analysis is divergent. What I find and how I come to conclusions, if they have an expert witness, is probably going to be different than how that person comes to conclusions. So even in very convergent type cases um, where it's like, you know, this is, this is, and I don't deal with these cases, but, you know, it's, it's like the, the bullet that was shot, you know, it shows these certain grooves that was from this barrel, and, and then you'll have like another expert witness saying, well, that could have still happened, you know, regardless, you know, with the style of gun and things like that. So, um, but, you know, anyway, you're going to, you're going to get, try to become discredited. And as long as you're confident in yourself and keep yourself paced, you know, typically you're, you're fine. And one of the things is a jury, in my experience, is not um, going to tolerate a lot of attempts at trying to discredit an expert witness, especially if an expert witness is genuine and 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 being you know answering questions and being very thoughtful in those in those questions. So, um, so a few facts. So, communications between an attorney and a consulting expert are covered by the attorney-client privilege. So, what I work with with the attorney and the law firm. We talk back and forth on the phone or by Skype or whatever. Um, that's protected by attorney-client privilege. And the attorney is free to discuss trial strategy issues with the consulting expert. I'm the consulting expert. Um, this is particularly true in cases involving uh, issues of malpractice. Now, we talk about malpractice. Educational malpractice is hard to prove. So in educational um um, lit litigation that tends to kind of go more towards systems like not following systems that were in place systems of how to refer systems of how to respond to certain so the students with certain needs and so forth so i'm um, not acting uh, exercising a harmful bias to an action knowingly not in the best interest of the student or the institution so that's where that really comes into play um, it, it's it's not nearly as clear as if it was hospital malpractice, for example. So educational malpractice is uncommon, um, but what what usually happens in those cases is it, is it becomes procedural. So, so we talked about um, what is what is discovery. So, well, first of all, I you know I've talked about what it is to be a consulting expert. So, the moment you then become an a litigation is filed and the law firm, the, the, the attorney wants to keep you on, you move from an, a, a consulting expert role to an expert witness role. So those are two different things. Consulting is kind of this behind the scenes. Do we have a case? And if so, like, what do we need? Um, what would be our angle on the case? Help us with strategy. And then if they decide to go forward with the case, they have the option then to retain you as an expert witness, which then elevates you up to a higher status in that that case. So um, what is discovery? We hear some of these terminal, uh, terminology. So I want to I want to talk about this. So what's discovery? So no matter what kind of civil case you're involved in, once a lawsuit is filed, the court will typically issue a scheduling order that includes a date by which all discovery must be completed. That's really important to know as an expert witness because I I worked in a legal case where we had a short a very short window to to ask for some new items under discovery um, that I felt were very uh, germane to the case. And we were able to do that. But again, you have a window. So you have to kind of come up with of saying, what do we want? What What is the information that we want? And what, what realistically will we be provided? Um, so anyway, discovery. So discovery is a legal term um, that consists of several tools that are used to uncover facts relevant to the various claims, defenses, at issue in the case. Example, like I deal with a lot of legal cases dealing with schools, so it might be minutes of a school board. Um, so you're going to request those under discovery if they're not publicly made available. Um, you might, you know, ask for um, teacher or faculty or administrator contracts so you understand the roles and responsibility and what they were, the expectations were for those individuals. Uh, performance reviews. I mean, things like that you might get under discovery. So um, the the parties in a lawsuit engage in discovery so they can be properly prepared for trial and avoid surprises that can adversely affect the outcome of the case. So, um, so I try to be very thoughtful in discovery. And I tend to be very um, much along a, a continuum. Like I'll look 
at a case and I'll say, let's go back 10 years and ask for like this, 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 and this, like over the past 10 years. And the reason I do that is one, I want to see if there was any change at any point in a very standard procedure. And if so, like what caused that change? Um, what brought that about? And if there wasn't a change and there were some kind of sentinel events that happened, why wasn't there a change? So I want to look at things like that over, over time to see if they've changed or if they haven't changed. So, um, Let's look at the um, different types of discovery. So there's different types of discovery, okay? And uh, so the parties are permitted to discover relevant facts through main three, three main types of written discovery. One is inter uh, interrogation. So that's asking, um, sitting down across from somebody. Um, that's the attorney. That's not me doing that. Asking, asking questions, interrogating that person. Um, the other part is request for a production of documents. Now, I found this very interesting because I, I, I usually come up with a pretty exhaustive uh, list of documents that, that I want discovered. Um, in one case, it was student handbooks, and it was, the, it was the craziest thing because it was a school district, a fairly large school district, um, and, and this was a case in fall, you know, that I was involved in, in a fall, um, and and I asked for the handbook from the school, you know, through the attorney. I said, get the handbook because let's see if what's in the handbook matches what's in policy and if it, how students are educated to the handbook and so forth. School said, we don't have handbooks. Like, we don't have any more. Like, you don't have any more handbooks, yet, like, you're still in the first semester and you probably are going to have 100 students move in this year. So, yes, you obviously have handbooks. You've been told by your legal counsel not to give the handbook. So... Um, in working with with uh, my you know legal counsel, I said you know do what it takes you know whether it's putting an ad in the paper, you know of saying hey you know if you have a handbook or from the past five years we'd love to have it, um, and 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 then you get maybe some different flavors of handbooks too. I mean you're not getting what the school is providing, you're getting some different handbooks that were issued you know throughout the past few years, and you can look at those. So it can actually kind of backfire against a a uh, defense team, if if they want to play hardball on things like that, have tried to stall you out and say, well, you know, district, tell them that you don't have any handbooks. I'm like, well, okay. All right. I, I know you do. I know there's a closet of handbooks, but um, if this is how you want to play it, then this is how we'll go about it. But just know now I'm going to have access to a number of, of handbooks, and I'll be able to compare those handbooks one against another against another and look for certain areas such as non-discrimination, um, and also programs that are offered in your school, also how you're accessing your harassment and um, input, inputs, non-discrimination, um, input system, threat reporting system. So, um, yeah, so, so those type of strategies, I shake my head a little bit because sometimes I'll work with legal counsel and say, oh, goodness, you know, it's, it's just it's buying time on the other side. Um, so, uh, so anyway... Um, Another part, so we have uh, interrogations of, of people, requests for production of documents, requests for admissions. So let's talk about that, requests for admissions, because people don't hear about that a lot. The purpose of requests for admissions is to get rid of issues that both parties agree upon. So both sides can save time, money, energy, you know, trial arguing over things that they um they, they they disagree and therefore you know many requests for admissions are pretty obvious and boring um, things like you know is this your name okay or is this your role have you been with the school district for this many years or whatever like if you can agree on those things which are things you are going to agree on yes okay now one of the things though that that comes up with that um, so that does time you know kind of streamline things but um, you can also you can also lose out on some very valuable information. Like one of the things in a school employee's job description, typically either is you ask them what is your title, and what they say their title is. It, does that match the actual title on the job description? I mean, what's the last time you've looked at your job description where you're at? Um, ask them what their role is. You know, like who they report to. Um, and also, there are typically statements in there like saying, and other duties as 
prescribed by the supervisor. So what are some of those other duties? So in that case, I do not want a simple admissions of saying, okay, your job is school counselor. Okay, we're set with that. No, I want you to describe what that means and how you interpret your um, job description. Okay, I want to know that. I want to know that. So um, in terror, uh, in um, interrogations are, are written questions that must be answered in writing and under oath. Requests for production of documents require a party to produce specified documents for inspecting and copying. Um, for example, yeah, if I'm asking the district for you know notes that they have specific to an investigation of harassment for a student, you know they need to to copy and to provide those to legal counsel. Um, requests for admissions. Seek to have a party admit the truthfulness of a statement or facts so that proof of that fact will not be necessary at trial. It's like, okay, is is this your name? Is this your title? Have you worked at these schools um, within the in the district, for example? How many years have you worked in this? How many years have you been in education? Things like that we agree upon. Boom. We don't have to go through those during, during court. So when I say we, the attorney. Not everything is open for discovery. So some information is deemed personal not relevant to the case. Um, so, you know, that that's very, um, you know, there, there's no need to ask someone, for example, um, you know, do you, um, do you identify in the LGBT um, population or something like that? Um, so, I mean, why would you do that? It, it, it's something that um, isn't isn't germane to the case. So, there will be questions which you're not going to to ask as an attorney. So, forming a discovery strategy. This is where I really am helpful with the legal teams that I work with. Um, at the outset of a lawsuit, an experienced attorney will formulate a discovery strategy. Uh, it's geared toward learning as much as possible about who the opposing parties trial witnesses will be like who, who are your witnesses going to be what their testimony will consist of what documents they'll offer to support their claims i can kind of figure that out because i know i've been in the school setting so i'm like this is probably what they're going to say these are the documents they're going to refer to and and and, and so forth and so these are the things that we're going to want to ask for and, and to to seek clarification on during discovery um and depending upon the number of witnesses involved and where they're located, the discovery process can be long and time consuming. Like I worked with an attorney who went to other states to um, interrogate witnesses who had worked with a district during a certain point in time. So, so yeah, um, but you know, it's, it's very essential for pretrial, you know, preparation. So what is a deposition? So a deposition is a, you know, a statement, and so these happen outside of the courtroom. Attorney is meeting with a person. That person can have their legal counsel there. That's fine. Um, and they're asking them them questions um, that pertain to the legal case. So in in understanding this, you know, and I help generate questions, but ultimately the the jury or you know judge or whatever is going to determine what would a reasonable person have done. You know, what would this person have done based upon their role, their expertise, their training, um, and were they acting in the best interest of themselves, of the student, of the institution, given the context and situation. Those are big, okay? And I'll look at cases and I'll say, like, this person I genuinely believe was acting in the best interest of the student given the information that, that this person had. I do not think that they should be pursued any further in this legal matter. It's up to the attorney what they want to do, but um, I'm very clear in making making those statements. Um, so how depositions work? Depositions don't take place in courtrooms. Um, instead, they usually take place in, in the attorney's offices, or the attorneys might go, if it's a school, they might go to a school and ask for a secured you know, location um, to, to conduct the um, deposition. Um, the attorneys will ask the witness or deponent a series of questions. I usually help generate those questions about facts and events related to the lawsuit with the entire deposition recorded word for word by a court reporter, which can also be a tape recorder that is transcribed. Um, most depositions that I've been a part of now are also videotaped, so they have the, the um, you, you can see the motions of the, of the, um, uh, 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 of, of, of the witness, but I've seen more and more, um, you know, vi videotapes that have been, been done of depositions. So, um, 
And again, you know, and you timestamp those things. You timestamp, and videotapes are naturally timestamped. You can say at the 22 minute and 30 second mark, you know, the person said this and, and, and whatever. So um, all parties to the case may attend the deposition and the depend, uh, deponent often has his or her attorney present. Not always, but albeit with a more limited role than the attorney would have in a courtroom. So this is really a fact-finding mission. Like, what was your role at the school? What was your role with the student? How did you, how did you know this student? Um, how was professional development carried out in your school? Did you know who your chain of command was, like who you were to go with questions, things like that? So generally, depositions can be broader than what's allowed in court. Attorneys for the deponent or uh, parties to lawsuit may make objections to some inquiries, but the deponent is usually obligated to answer all proper questions despite objections. So um, meaning like you just can't sit there and be quiet for like eight hours. You have to have a response um, if you're deposed. I mean, if, if you are responding um, to the plaintiff's attorney, you know, you have to answer questions. So um, a deposition can be short or it can be long. I mean, it can be seven, eight hours. It can be 15 minutes. The the ones I typically see, you know, they're, they're a few hours in length. So um, the opponent should listen to the questions carefully. If you're ever in this role as a deponent, okay, listen to the question carefully and answer them precisely, okay? You don't want to add additional information beyond what is asked of you. Um, Remember, deponents are under oath. False statements made under oath can have civil and criminal penalties. So defense strategies, uh, I'll see this a lot. The defense has worked with a deponent, so they're being asked questions, and the deponent will say, I don't understand the question. Could you rephrase that for me? Or I don't understand this term, or I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Those are all stall tactics. Those are all tactics, or you know, or could you demonstrate that, or, or I'm not sure... Um, you know what I can again what I'm not sure what you're asking me so those are strategies I don't remember I don't remember well we know that memory you know I talked about that fades um, you know that memory fades and, and also becomes conflated so um, I don't remember is a is a common statement by someone who's being deposed when you start to hear things like that it's like okay you're you've been instructed to do that by your attorney so um, Answering yes or no to open-ended questions, and this way the witness um, can't explain his or her response. So you'll have people um, that the plaintiff, um, who's representing, you know, let, let's say the parents of, of the student, if it's a case against the district, um, the plaintiff will ask, ask um, uh, you know, typically um, questions, and it, the deponent will try to answer yes or no to to open-ended questions. We'll try to answer yes or no, give as little as possible. The questioning attorney will ask why um, by asking that question. You know, you, you, you try to get people to explain themselves, um, but if people are coached well by their their other legal counsel, they're not going to get into that very much. So one of the things I, I, I go back to is there's a parallel here. Russell Acoff. Russell Acoff, um, thinking and um systems thinking. He was a widely recognized uh, pioneering systems thinker. He was taught at Wayne University, uh, Case Institute of Technology in the Wharton School, where he uh, was an Anheuser-Busch Professor Emeritus of the Management Scientist. So if you Google Russell Acoff, you'll learn about it, uh, a lot about him. But um, one of the things um, he talks about um, or, or talked about was improving the performance of the parts of a system. So I, I try to look at schools as systems, like where, where are the systems, how do the systems connect, how do people receive professional development, how do they know who to go to, what was the follow-up, what was the documentation. That's where I really get into areas. Not so much into people's judgment, but so much more into the systems of the school functioning. So improving the performance of the parts of a system taken separately will necessarily improve the performance of the whole. That's a false statement, okay? In fact, it can destroy an organization such as a school. Let's, let's say that you, you take a Rolls-Royce engine, you put it in a Hyundai. Um, it's going to make that Hyundai in, in operable. So one of the things that tends to come up in, in legal proceedings is, is this issue called benchmarking. So let's talk, what is benchmarking? Benchmarking means it's comparing um, one's processes and performance metrics to industry best and best practices from other 
um, organization. So you might say like, this is typically like what schools do. Like we're benchmarking, like we were doing this compared to whatever school. The issue with that is like, and I've talked about this before, schools are a unit of measure by themselves. I want to know about that specific school, okay? I don't need to know how this benchmarks against 100 other schools. I want to know that school, what that school was doing. Um, and, and, and that's key. I believe the school's smallest unit of measure for many things, often school discipline referrals, for example, um, are, are school dependent. Um, the neighborhood, the actual resources in the school, how long the staff have been around. So that's very important to me. So I, I, I bring things down to the school as the unit of measurement. And I, I'm not much into, you know, comparing school against school against school against school. I want to know what happened in this school. Um, with that said, districts, you know, they still must have integrated reliability. So if you're at district office and you're in charge of whatever, you need to know what's happening at your school. If you have bullying or harassment reporting forms, those should be standardized reports throughout the school, how students are educated to those, um, how they're made aware of those should be standardized throughout the, the buildings. And, you know, outside of those processes should be, be convergent, meaning if a principal went from this school to this school, there should be, be consistency in that. And if principal, if a parent moved their child from one school to another, they should have consistency in understanding, oh, this is how I make a bullying report. Like it's the same from school to school. Um, but again, how the resources are in that school, what the school does to promote school culture, non-discrimination, those things are all going to have their unique flavor to that school and the environment that it resides in. So that's, that's benchmarking. Um, and you, you'll see benchmarking come out a lot in legal cases where people will try to say, well, well, Mr. Proden, you know this, or, or Dr. Proden, come on, it's doctor. Um, Dr. Proden, you know this, this seems to be the, the standard practice for schools, you know, that this is the expectation of whatever I say. You know, I, I I get that, but in in this specific school and looking at the school as a unit, um, this is what the school did or or did not do. So we are looking at the school, and also in my research, I do not find that schools are comparable on unit to unit. And if they counter me with saying yes, but there's national data, whatever, I will say yes. But there are also congressional testimonies by individuals such as Kent Trump on three occasions indicating that um, aggregate data at a, at a national level uh, for school non-discrimination, for example, is not valid for these reasons. So, so yes, what you're saying, but I'm saying I'm looking at the unit of measurement, which is this school. So um, anyway, um, systems thinking is holistic. We talked about R Russell Acoff. It attempts to derive understanding of parts from the behavior and properties of wholes rather than derive the behavior and properties of wholes from those of their parts. We talked about the car again, like a Mercedes will work because it's all Mercedes parts. So if you start mixing in like the best Hyundai engine and the best, you know, whatever exhaust and the best whatever, it doesn't work. It's not all the same. So uh, disciplines are taken by science to represent different parts of the reality we experience. We have disciplines in school. School psych does a certain job. School counselor does a certain job. Principal does a certain job. Teacher does a certain job. You need to understand those, then you need to understand that transdisciplinary approach about how all those work together. That's how I help in legal cases. So what I do, I determine the viability of a case. Is it viable? If so, I prioritize strategies. Um, another thing, I recognize my own strengths, ways to become informed, my own limitations. Is this case a match for my skill set? Um, if it's something, you know, I, I just don't, it's, it's just not my wheelhouse, that's fine. I'll let people know. Um, if it's something that's close or it's in my wheelhouse, you know, and I can acquire the knowledge, I'll do that. That's fine. Um, but I, I do not um, get into cases that I, I believe where I cannot represent myself as an expert witness. Um, I help... Uh, legal counsel assemble discovery requests and deposition requests. I might be writing out like, here's 90 questions to ask this person. Literally, like I have done that. Here are 90 questions to ask this person because I know I've been a director. I work in this realm. I know what to ask. Um, analyze. I analyze documents from discovery, from depositions. I help summarize those, strategize, you know, what do we do next? Identify inconsistencies and in witnesses' stories, especially witness, across witnesses. Um, also, like um, uh, what's not uh, where the lack of continuity is between procedure, policy, administrative reg, and and how people actually have done things. Um, 
looking at IPs over time, this IP versus this IP versus this IP, handbooks over time, inconsistencies, inconsistency between handbook and policy, things like that. That's what I'm looking for. I look for patterns over time. That's my strength as an expert witness is I'm looking over time. And I think that makes a very, very compelling, strong case of looking over time of one, was there some type of Sentinel event that happened that changed protocols? Okay, changed protocols. And if so, what was the training then of staff of those, those protocols? How was that implemented? How do you determine what you needed to change? The second thing is, was there a Sentinel event and nothing changed, which is very common. And in that case, it's like, well, come on, what does it take? You know, um, so I look over, you know, I, I'm looking over the, the, those, those, I'm looking over time. So I help to understand the defendant strategy, um, you know, such as, um, you know, working with the plaintiff and the defendant is using the, I don't understand the question. It's like, okay, um, that's not, that's something that, you know, it can work to our advantage, you know, sometimes. So recommendations to you. So act in the best interest of the person or others given the, the con of yourself and also the context and situation. You have the context and situation saying, I did the best I could in this context and situation. I, I did the best that, that I thought um, uh, was warranted for this context and situation. Training, if you're in a position to train, document who you've trained, when you've trained them, what you, materials you've used and make a printout and keep a copy of that. Time stamp it, identify who was present, preferably have them sign in. Um, Boy, you wouldn't believe the number of times in legal cases when that's simply not there. When did you do your suicide prevention training? I think we did it in fall. What materials did you use? I don't know. Who is there? I don't know. Uh, what did you do for someone who might have started three weeks later? I don't know. I, I'm not sure what our induction process is. That is horrible. What's your and also you know what's your chain of command if you have questions about something like who do you go and ask? Um, to have those things clearly laid out. If you have those clearly laid out, that, that strengthens you significantly. Document with timestamps and maintain copies in electronic paper and form. So again, if you're emailing out to people, here's a reminder, by the way, of our harassment policy. If you can review this with your students, that would be um, that would be ideal if you could, you know, by this Friday and you've sent that email out and you keep a copy of that email, um, and, you know, like, and also put in there, if you have any questions, contact me. Okay, if you're that person or if you're that teacher who's gone through that with students that you document what you went through, the materials you went through, and when you went through it. Th those simple acts can substantially put you in a better position if you are named in litigation. Substantially put you in a better position. Um, always investigate. Okay, uh, if a student um, comes forward with harassment allegations, Schools need to have a procedure to investigate those and to document, uh, to interview the people involved, um, to keep record that that occurred. Uh, there typically are procedures for that, but again, a lot of that is never done in my experiences. Uh, be explicit in rules and terms. Know that students with uh, language disabilities might not comprehend the handbook. This is where I say, hey, if you're a student with a disability, you should have an, an IEP goal indicating that you will understand what harassment is and how to report it, like in the handbook, for example, if you have um, social communication deficits. So, um, you know, do things like that, be explicit. And I taught my students, and, and we had a circle of, what does it mean to be harassed, and examples of things like that. Um, that will help you immensely if you're ever named in a legal suit. If you can produce that, through discovery of saying, I went through my students, here's the materials we went through, here's the date, you are in a much stronger position, okay? I'm sharing this with you. Um, have a well-understood, uncluttered input system. Uh, the NFL went just a few years ago to app-based um, input of things happening at the stadium, you know, whether it could be a fight or somebody having a cardiac arrest. They did it so even 80-year-old um, ushers who have never used a smartphone could use the pictures on the phone to report it. So there are a number of systems out there. I have one in the back in, in the, the YouTube version, Sprigio, S-P-R-I-G-E-O dot com, that you can access, Sprigio dot com. Uh, but there are many out there. So uh, read the handbook, ask questions, encourage people to ask questions. Handing somebody a handbook and saying, or it's on the website, here it is, 
that's not sufficient anymore. How do you demonstrate that people understood the handbook or also that they had an opportunity to ask questions about the handbook, especially in reporting non-discrimination or um, threats of harm to self or harm to others? So um, evolving tactic, something that's, that, that's a trend out there I want you to be aware of. It's an evolving tactic. It's school boards or, you know, schools, but school boards are trying to separate themselves from the individuals named in a lawsuit. The school board is going to say, and I've seen this more than, more often than not lately, school board would say, that person acted on their own. They acted it with their own bias. They acted outside of policy and procedure. So basically, like, you know, they're they're on their own. We're not representing them. You know, they, they did this. They knew they shouldn't have done it. And the person's like, I didn't know. I didn't get any training from the school on you know, on how to, to bring this information forward to an IEP team meeting or whatever concerns I had about a student. We don't have a student assistance team and things like that. So um, just be very aware of that. And also, I think if I think it's important to understand your personal liability, talk to your insurance carrier, um, especially if you are in education now in other fields of different liabilities, and also your personal um, errors and omissions insurance, okay? Um, those are things that can be very much beneficial to you in the event that you are named in a lawsuit, basically to help you uh, survive that event and any potential settlement that comes out of that um, so it doesn't drain your life savings and potentially your state retirement and make it almost impossible for you to find employment somewhere else. So my recommendations to you. Again, big time stamping things, making copies of things, any emails you send, um, copying, you know, those, having copies of those, maybe creating, you know, your your file. One thing, too, is like you can create your electronic file that's owned by the school that can be quickly shut down. So create your paper file, too. Um, and it's 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 just it's important, folks, because I have been involved in cases um, and I'll continue to be involved in cases where if you're named as a plaintiff, you know, if you're a school psych or a counselor, whatever, I mean, these, these matters are extremely serious. Um, it, it, it can basically, um, almost destroy your life, um, in, in, for especially the, the time that the litigation goes on. I urge you to be very cooperative. Uh, now I'm saying that as a plaintiff, you know, your, your legal counsel is going to tell you whatever, but, um, to be be very cooperative because ultimately through discovery um, things come out you know th things come out so um, but not to fear you know the positions acting in the best interest of people and documenting and then also if you're unclear like you send an email to a supervisor saying I'm unclear about this I don't understand this I need you to help me better understand this or tell me who I should go to because that also then would be something through discovery that could be admitted in saying this person was trying to seek um, understanding and, and someone to help them under, you know work with this and and it seems like the district didn't do that so then if I'm the person who's trying to seek you know, help through my chain of command and it wasn't returned to me. It's a chain of command which really failed. It wasn't me. I was trying to seek out and act in the best interest of that student. So anyway, um, I, you know, I, th this is fascinating stuff for me. You know, I've been, I've been doing this now for a while. I was, I never intended to do this. I was contacted to do this. Um, and it was based upon some presentations I had given. And I, I solely am contacted by this now. I, I do not go out and seek any of these cases. I have cases uh, presented to me by different legal counsels across the United States and uh, and then ask, you know, providing information, having me reviewed, and asking if I have uh, any interest in serving um, as a consultant to developing the case or possibly being retained as an expert witness. So um, just to, to kind of give you an insight of, of what that world is, is like, um, so you can also prepare your yourself if you're ever on an end of that where you're needing to um, be um, dispo uh, be a witness you know deposed in a, in, in for questioning um, and again my my goal in this folks I mean really is to see justice and I I was with one case where a school district could have changed policy and procedure 
and after a substantial event and, and didn't and the event repeated itself a year later and you know I just kind of look and shake my head at that and like why because the ultimate thing is we, we want we want students to be safe um, staff to be safe and anything that is is you know a disconnect in procedure whatever we identify it and, and we we remedy it so um, that's it folks